worshiping today at Yale Avenue Presbyterian Church due to the fire at our St. Andrew's Church House. We're grateful to the pastor and elders of Yale Avenue Church allowing us to record our service here. So welcome. Welcome. Wow. Please join with me, call to worship this morning. Clap your hands, people of God. We shout with loud songs of joy. Sing your praises, people of God. We make a joyful noise. Look around you, people of God. We see the power of God at work among us.
Please join with me, time of confession and silent prayer. Let us confess our sin and our need for God. Gracious God, you encourage us with your love, bringing new life out of death. We need that love in our lives and all our relationships because we have hurt others and have been hurt by them. Forgive us, O God, for your spirit of wisdom and healing upon us, that by our lives we might glorify you. assurance of God's pardon this week. Christ did not come to condemn, but to forgive. We can believe the good news. Thanks be to God. Our reading today is from 1 John, chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his Spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, 
so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers or sisters, are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Responsible reading from the psalm this week. I will give thanks to God with my whole heart. I will tell all God's wonderful days. I will be glad and be delight in God. I will sing praise to God's name. I will sing praise to the star. The Gospel reading today is taken from the Gospel according to John, chapter 15, beginning with the first verse. These are the words of Jesus. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit, and every branch that bears fruit he prunes to make it more fruitful. You have already been cleansed or pruned by the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Whoever does not abide in me is thrown away like a branch and withers. Such branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Ask for whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and become my disciples. Here ends our reading from John 15, verses 1 through 8. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Jesus said, I am the true vine. The Gospel of John is well known for the sayings of Jesus, I am. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the gate for the sheep. I, I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way and the truth and the life. And finally, number seven, by no accident, I am the true vine. Last week we talked about Jesus as the good shepherd and, and we said that some people might have trouble understanding that because they have never seen a sheep, have never heard of a shepherd. But over the centuries, it became such a beloved image of Jesus that it is in stained glass all over the world, as you see behind me here. I am the good shepherd. I care for my sheep. And from a thousand years before people thought of King David as the shepherd king, of the 23rd Psalm as the Lord is my shepherd, Jesus is the one who cares for us, sustains us, protects us. And then today, 
we read that Jesus is the true vine. I don't know about you, but most people probably have at least a little bit of knowledge of gardening. Over the years, I have planted a few tomatoes and peppers and different things. And, and, and I know that it, it takes water and, and fertilizer and, and it takes being connected. So Jesus is saying that to grow, to be sustained, you must be connected. You must be a branch that is a part of Jesus, the vine. The vine pulls water and minerals and nourishment up from the soil and pushes them out to the branches and they bear fruit. Hopefully tomatoes or peppers or something else. I am the true vine. Uh, uh, we can understand then that Jesus once again is saying that he cares for us. He nourishes us. He provides for our needs. I am the true vine. If you are cut off from the vine, you simply wither and die. We know, for example, if the blood supply is cut off on our arm, our hand would, would not be able to function. We need the circulation. If, if we are not a part of Jesus, if we are not connected, growing out from the vine, we die and wither, or wither and die. And that can happen, can it? Uh, you know, uh, there was a concern recently for veterans in the state of Oklahoma committing suicide at a much higher rate than the national average. And, and people are trying to do something about that, uh, all kinds of ways of helping. But the first thing that was said in the newspaper was that there is a need for support. Networks of family members, civic organizations, fraternal organizations, especially religious groups, places where they can turn to, where they can connect with people. We believe as Christians, we need to be connected with Jesus to be nourished and sustained and to have life in him. And, and Jesus says that, that the purpose of being a branch of the vine is that we will bear fruit. We will bear fruit. Well, not tomatoes, not peppers, but the fruit that is love for God and love for one another. The reading from 1 John today makes it very plain that, that the fruit of the Christian life is love. Love the Lord. Love your neighbor as yourself. But do you ever think about why did the writer to John, 1 John, go to so much trouble to talk about love, love, love? I think it's because there was a lack of love. Usually when you read about something, when you hear a preacher preaching over and over about something, it's because there is a need, there is a lack. He was expressing a concern that within that church, that Christian community, there apparently was a lack of love. And, and so he wanted his people to know that we should love one another, that we should care for each other, that we should be connected to each other. We're not to live alone or isolated. It's not simply me and Jesus. It's all of us together, nourished and sustained by our relationship with the Lord. Now, 
sometimes, sometimes the fruit that comes on the vine or on the branches may be rotten, may not be good fruit. There is a, a study that is being done right now by the uh, Billy Graham Center for Evangelism at Wheaton College. Ed Stetzer is the director of that center. And they are asking, what are the gaps to evangelism in North America? What, where are the, the problems that prevent us from sharing the good news all over North America? And, and here's what they say of the four things, the number one gap is called the credibility gap. And, and they say that there is a, a, a gap of holiness that, that the church is not perceived as uh, living up to its own standards. And they go all the way back to uh, Jimmy Swaggart and, and uh, Jim and Tammy Faye Baker. <laughs> That's been a lot of time ago now. We have seen problems of priests in the Catholic Church. We have seen problems of pastors in large mega churches and, and everywhere in between. The church has simply not lived up to its ideal. We have not been the people that we think we should be. Years ago, when I pastored a church in Louisiana, uh, the members of our church were really fond of Jimmy Swaggart. Uh, not so much his preaching, but his music. Uh, he and his cousins came out of a rockin' music environment in Louisiana, and, and, and people liked his music. And uh, when he was caught with a prostitute, uh, they were very disappointed, very hurt, and, and felt betrayed. And, and I'll never forget, one woman in our church came up to me and she said, you know, I, I, that really hurt me that, that, he, that he did that. It, it, it really bothered me. He said, I don't believe I can trust any preachers anymore. I, I, it, I, I'm that upset. And then she said, Lynn, I'm going to be keeping my eye on you too. Oh, <laughs> I said, actually, that's good. That's good. We Presbyterians believe that we are accountable. Uh, we, we don't believe we can just do anything we want without being accountable to, in, in the case of ministers, the Presbytery, in the case of ministers and members, the session. I, I think you ought to keep an eye out on me, but, but it reflects the damage that the lack of credibility has caused for the Christian church in the last few years. But you know, sometimes that, that fruit may not necessarily be bad fruit. It may not be immorality or, or such, but, but sometimes it, it seems the church has gotten the reputation for being negative, for being judgmental. And instead of preaching good news, it, it's bad news. And, and that disturbs me because it, it spreads even further. People are turned off about the church condemning people instead of expressing God's love of inclusion. Heard an interesting podcast recently. Tom Rayner, who is retired as the executive of Lifeway Southern Baptist Resources, was talking with Kevin Ezell, who is the executive, present executive of the Southern Baptist North American Mission Board. It's the group that plants new churches and seeks to revive churches. And, and they were talking about what is it, what is it that's going to happen in the, in the next two years, between now and 2023? What, what's the church going to look like in 2023? And 
they were saying there are there are problems. There are problems. The 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 churches are not going to grow just by transfer growth, you know, people moving from one town to another town or getting mad and leaving one church and going to another church. That's transfer growth. He says that's not going to happen anymore. Churches are going to have to really work at sharing the good news. And then he said something that I found very interesting. He said, the churches that will thrive, Christians who will share the good news, are churches that are going to be for rather than churches that are going to be against. And he told this story. He said that uh, they were planning churches in the San Francisco area and conservative Christians think of San Francisco as the most difficult place to evangelize in the world. I, I know that that's not literally true. There's some strong churches in that area, but, but he was saying San Francisco area, he said they got a call from, and he defined this person as a lesbian principal of a school. And he said she was partners with another principal at a different school. And that principal said that they had a church group renting their cafetorium. And she had discovered that the morale of the teachers and the involvement of the parents, everything had improved when that church came into their school. And so this woman, described again as a lesbian principal, asked if the Southern Baptist couldn't bring a church into her school as well. Now, think about that. Think about that. Southern Baptists have a, a, a reputation being again this and again that and again the other. A and here is the head of the National Mission Board saying, we need to be for, not against. We need to be for people. We need to be for the communities. Now he said, we don't compromise our beliefs. We don't change what we think is right or wrong, but we need to be for. We need to be for. Isn't that what Jesus is saying? He is the bread. He is the light. He is the shepherd. He is the vine that provides nourishment for, for you and for me in order that we can share good news. We can share the love of Christ with one another. We live in a very polarized society. It's us versus them. It's negativity gets votes and sometimes gets church members. But he's saying we need to become for churches, not again churches, right? There was a story in the Tulsa world about uh, a city council in one of the suburbs. Now, you have to know that even something as serious and as frightening as the, the virus and uh, vaccinations and masks have become polarized, haven't they? You're for them or against them. And it's not just you feel one way and somebody else feels another. You are right and they are wrong. And so the city of Tulsa has fairly strict requirements until recently. The suburbs were much more lax, except not too long ago, the city of Broken Era instituted a mask ordinance. I heard that that meeting was chaotic. People were hollering and screaming at each other. Since then, they've had another election and the votes changed. And so they voted to repeal that mask ordinance. But one of the new members had something to say about that. He had said, 
that he would vote for repeal. But listen to what he said. Noting that his grandfather had died of COVID just the week before, he said that the disease is a very real disease, impacting very real people. I feel like in the mind of the middle of this debate over this, that that actually gets lost. I feel like we forget there are actually real people suffering from this. He didn't use the word love, but isn't that what he was saying? We need to be aware of and loving toward one another. And, and I believe even though Jesus was speaking to disciples, brothers and sisters in the faith, he is also talking about how we bear fruit in, in our civil living, in our relationships, and in, in how we get along with people so that the animosities, the, the, the hatreds, the negativities are overcome by love. Jesus said, I am the true vine. Your branches and you are called to bear the fruit of love in all of your relationships, within the churches, in business, in school, in your families, in city council meetings, wherever. Brothers and sisters, let love be genuine. Care for one another. Love as Jesus has loved us. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we do hear your call to love. And, and yet there are so many temptations to raise our voices in anger, to say that we're right and everybody else is wrong. Give us a sense of humility, of love and caring in all of our relationships, we pray, O oh Lord. In Christ's name, amen.
especially on this Easter Sunday, we come together to the Lord's table, knowing our risen Lord, who comes and fellowships with us. This is the joyful feast of the people of God. And according to the Gospel of Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples in Emmaus, he took the bread and blessed it and broke it, gave it to them, and their eyes were opened and they recognized their Lord. This indeed is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites all those who trust in him to share the feast that he has prepared. Our Book of Order says that the opportunity to eat and drink with Christ is not a right bestowed upon the worthy, but a privilege given to the undeserving who come in faith, repentance, and love. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, lift them, them to, to the Lord. Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right, right to, to give, give our thanks and praise. and praise. It is truly right and our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, O Lord our God, creator of the universe. You formed us in your image, setting us in this world to love and to serve you and to live in peace with your whole creation. When we rebelled against you, refusing to trust and obey you, you did not reject us, but still claimed us as your own. You sent prophets to call us back to your way. Then, in the fullness of time, out of your great love for the world, you sent your only Son to be one of us, to redeem us and heal our brokenness. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the faithful of every time and place, who say to the glory of your name, Holy, 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 holy Lord, God, God of power, power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna in the highest. Thank you for Jesus, for his teaching and healing, for his challenging and feeding for his living and dying and rising, that we might be raised with him and all the world made new. We thank you that on the night before he died, he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and shared it with his friends. With thanksgiving, we take this bread and wine, gifts of the good earth, offering ourselves as a living sacrifice dedicated to your service, for great is the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ, Christ has risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come, come again. again. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on your <coughs> gathered people and on these gifts, bread and wine of earth, to body and blood of heaven, our frail flesh and blood to your holy people, that we might be Christ's body to your world. For this world we now pray, Help our congregation during this Easter season in spite of the disruption of our fire and dislocation. Help all of us deal with the pandemic and social isolation. Guide us in responding to disruptions and disasters and all war. Mend your wounded earth. Heal those who suffer. Comfort those who mourn. And infuse us with your peace that is rooted in what is just. Through the power of your spirit, unite us with Christ and with one another as we work and wait in hope, confident in that day when Christ will come to make all things well and we will feast together at his heavenly table. All glory and honor are yours, holy God, through Christ and in the unity of the Spirit, now and forever. Amen, amen, amen. 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 As Jesus taught his disciples, let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Listen now to the words of institution of the Lord's Supper. As we read from the Apostle Paul, The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread and after giving thanks to God, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. The Apostle Paul adds that every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the saving death of the Lord until he comes again. Ministering in the name of our Lord, I take this bread which has been blessed, broken, and say to you, take and eat, this is for you. same way after supper, Jesus took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, poured out for many for the remission of sin. All of you drink of it. serving today by intinction, which simply means that you take the bread and dip it into the wine or grape juice. Let us pray. Gracious, abundant God, we wait for the fulfillment of your desires for all of your creation. But even now at this table in this meal, you have met us in Christ. We thank you for feeding us with the bread of life and quenching our thirst with the cup of salvation. As we have been nourished and strengthened here in your love, send us out into the world by the power of your Holy Spirit to share your life and love and salvation with all whom we meet. In the name of our Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.
As we have gathered here virtually, we now go our separate ways. We have been nourished by God's word. We have been nourished by the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. And now we go to be God's people in the world, to share God's love, to proclaim good news in Jesus Christ. And, and as you go, know every day the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the communion, fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace now and every day. Amen. Fire at our St. Andrews 